Thank you. Wow. Um, first of all, I thank um, uh, Miss Leanna Schooley and the Center for Texas Studies and the Fort Worth Library for inviting me to speak to you today. And just to tell you a little bit about me, I'm from Florida. I uh, moved here in the year 2000 to come uh, teach at TCU. My PhD is from Louisiana State University. And as, as um, she mentioned, I'm a Latin Americanist. So the topic I'm speaking to you about is, is not my, uh, my own research, it's kind of secondary research. Um, my research is among indigenous groups in, in Central America for the most part. I got interested in this topic though when I, when I moved here initially. It was a, as a geographer, it was a curiosity I had, um, which was how, you know, as you drive across Texas, I-20, and you're in the, you know, if you're coming from Louisiana, you're in the pine trees, and then you're in the, the oaks and pines, and eventually you're more into the oaks and other deciduous trees. And then finally, there's some prairie, and then you get to somewhere in Arlington, and uh, all of a sudden there's these trees again. You know, and I thought, well, how does this happen? Is it somehow magically raining more in Arlington than it is in Dallas? And of course, that doesn't make any sense. And so I always had kind of a curiosity uh, about, about that. Um, I'm drawing today upon, I have a list, I have a slide at the end with all my sources, but I, there's a geographer, Terry Jordan, um, in a, he changed his name eventually to Terry Jordan uh, Bykoff. Okay. I'm not speaking loud enough, apparently. <laughs> I don't usually wear microphones, I usually just project out, so now I might be too loud eventually, so I <laughs> apologize for that. Um, he was a, a longtime geographer at University of North Texas, then he taught at SMU, Terry Jordan I'm talking about, and then he eventually ended up at the University of Texas, Austin, and he's an expert in these matters, uh, Texas and cultural historical geography. Um, he passed away about 10 years ago, but just, um, Amazing. Anything he does, I really, I really enjoy. I also draw a lot from uh, a geographer named Frank Aviglia, who wrote about the cross timbers and other things. Uh, <clears throat> as an aside, one of his other books is about the outline of the state of Texas, the outline map of the state of Texas, and how you know you don't see other states where they use the outline of the state in marketing to the to the degree that you see the outline of the state of Texas. Everything from like the label on a can of beans to hot tubs being made in the shape of Texas. Um, and another um, individual, a geographer from University of North, North Texas, he's a geomorphologist, and I draw on his, his work quite a bit in this presentation uh, as well. And there's some others, but those are the main ones. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna move around and hopefully you can still hear me. I, I'm going to eventually have some maps, and I like to point at the map, and so that's why I don't like to stand behind the podium that much. Um, so <clears throat> I have this interest in the cross timbers and how they came to be, and we'll look at a case study of that. And it, but it also influences settlement, and it plays a role in settlement, and we'll get to that too in just a minute. First, I need to talk about a few terms. One is just this term geography. And it's kind of a nebulous subject. When people hear history, everybody knows what that is. When they hear geography, they think, you know, capitals on the map. Uh, but it's so much more than that. We really combine, um, really one field is anything to do with culture and what we call human geography. And the other is physical geography or the environment. And so we combine the two. And you'll see that in this presentation. And it's pretty common to do that. In the last couple decades, we've had technology with maps just explode. And so there's a thing called geographic information systems, and that comes out, some of you may have heard of this. It's actually a booming field within geography. Um, so it's, it's more than maps. It's more than, you know, what's the name of the capital of Texas and so on. It's so much more. It's, it's about analyzing. Um, one definition of geography is the study of the surface of the earth and everything on it which is true, um, but it's also pretty broad, right? So I like the why of where, uh, the why of where. So it's about place, it's about location. Just like history studies, sort of like 
As history is the time, you might think geography is to space or space on the surface of the earth. How do people organize um, space? How do they use space in place and how do they have an impact on it? So during the presentation, I'll introduce a few themes in geography as they relate to this. One is environmental determinism. And this is an old theme in geography. It used to be late 1800s, early 1900s. There were a lot of geographers who were environmental determinists. In other words, the environment determined human behavior. It had such an impact that it forced people to be a certain way. Um, that's no longer the case. That's, um, that's, that's out of vogue. It's been shown to be an exaggeration, I guess I'd say. Uh, nowadays, we follow something more like what's called possibilism, which the environment plays a role, but people choose based on their own experience, uh, their culture, their history, they choose among those possibilities. So the environment plays a role, but it doesn't determine. It doesn't determine, just, just possibilism. All right, so we'll see some of that in this presentation. And then a couple of uh, sayings that are out there that kind of inform this presentation. <coughs> geography is the stage on which history takes place. Right? It has a foundation, it has a place, and that's geography. So history and geography go together, in my view, very well. And I read a book once uh, where, by a historian, and he said, nature draws the first line in human settlement. And I agree with that for the most part. In other words, people, in early settlement, it was about physical geography. It was something about soils or rivers or mounts, something about that influenced people where to have a settlement. Okay. But culture adds detail to the sketch. So it's not just physical geography, it's also, it's also culture. All right, so the main question, I guess we'll say too, my original, you know, how did the cross timbers come to be? Why do we have these cross timbers in the middle of a prairie? Um, and then also, the other main question that I have here, if the upland southerners, and I'll explain who they are in, in a few minutes, if they were here first, and they were, and they settled this area first, why were the Germans and Czechs able to come a few decades later and still get the best soils? Because they did. But how does that happen? You would think the first people there would get the best soil. And both were agriculturalists, and, and of course, you know, back, stepping back in time, a lot more people were agriculturalists, farmers, than, than today, right? So this is, the soil is the resource, and so this is critical. All right, so I have a few maps, <clears throat> and this one is, know that it's population density, it's not necessarily just the time, but uh, it's population density per per square mile of two or more pe people. So I'm showing this map for a few re reasons. We have the three early culture hearths. So there's the Northeast, and they sometimes call Yankee culture or Northeastern culture, and New England culture, and they spread across the North. The Mid-Atlantic, um, one branch goes to the Midwest, one branch goes to what becomes the Upland South Southerners, and then the Tidewater South Sea, comes down along the coast. This is the Gulf Coastal Plain. This is the plantation south. And by the way, you can trace um, linguistics, house types. They all follow these patterns. And of course, now you can, you can use it, uh, trace DNA and see that you know, these are the, the trends right in here. All right, so you see the time period in Texas. These folks, a lot of them coming from the upper uh, the upland south. And this is eight, 1840s and 50s, 1830 early on. Now, this is a little bit better map that I wanted to illustrate. So the mid culture region, sort of the middle, mid Atlantic, has two branches, and one of them becomes the upland south. The upland south is not just the northern south, it's not necessarily about being north, it's about being up land, it's elevation. So there, because of the source regions of the two populations and also the different elevations, there's actually two subcultures, so to speak. There's a, there's a lower Gulf coastal plain, the tidewater south, and then these 
uh, upland south southerners who are mostly of British origin and they may have been here you know a few generations but they descend for the most part uh, from British stock right and and they're the frontiersmen they're the um, you know the the front they they settle the frontier they um, you know, they cut down areas when it gets too crowded, they move on to the next place uh, for the most part. Okay. Well, notice they're the ones coming down into our area of North Texas. So <clears throat> this map was from 10 years earlier, but what it's showing is upland southerners and these areas. This is the lowland southerners or the tidewater south in East Texas and kind of southeast Texas. We've got people of Mexican origin in South Texas, and then some European settlement in sort of South and Middle Texas by 1850. This, by the way, is a, is a classic house type of the upland southerners. It's called a dog trot house. And sometimes, this one is, you know, a, a, maybe a little bit better off than the average dog trot house would have been in the, in the, in the 1800s, but often they start with one room, what they call a pen, and with a chimney, and then they build a cross, and with time, then they add a second one. And this house um, really is about the environment. It's about the wood that's available, um, but also it's kind of like having before the concept of the modern garage came around, I mean, they had, a, they had a work shelter. So they would, and this is what the dog trot part is, right, a dog can run through here. But you can bring your wagon through here if you needed to, or you can work on something right here in the shade or out of the rain. So it's a, it's a workspace. So you see these around this area. If you've been to the log cabin village right here nearby, uh, next to TCU, you'll see one of these. And there's another house type I don't have a picture of called a saddlebag where the chimney's in the middle and the rooms are on either side of that. And you can see that over there too. That's another common house type of the Upland South uh, Southerners. And um, by the way, Terry Jordan also wrote the guidebook to the Log Cabin Village. He's an expert in these, in these house types. Okay, <clears throat> so another concept in geography that's really awesome. I love this one. This is great. So pre-adaptation, often termed cultural pre-adaptation. And what's really neat about this is that, well, a couple things. I mean, you can read the definition up there. And, and the map, I love this map. This map is awesome. It's just beautiful. And the idea is, is that culture groups, and of course this applies more to the past and the present, but imagine the settlement of the, of the United States or Canada or anywhere. And these cultural groups come, and some of them will possess already some knowledge and skills that will help them in their new location. And particularly think about an agricultural setting. And, and this is just kind of common sense. So let's say if I grow up in, in Manaus, in the middle of the Amazon, and I move to, uh, I don't know, San Bernardino, California, or somewhere, in the, somewhere dry, like Arizona. If I was a subsistence farmer in the Amazon, what am I going to grow and what am I going to know how to grow in Arizona or the Sahara or some desert somewhere, right? So the plants are different, the soils are different, the climate is different. But if I migrate to a place that's kind of similar, another rainforest, I'll be able to adapt. Maybe there's some new plants, maybe the soils are a little bit different, but they're still somewhat similar and it'll be easier for me to adapt. So I'm more likely to be successful in the new place. A corollary to this is that people tend to, they don't always do this, but they tend to seek out somewhere similar that they're familiar with. Again, that doesn't always happen, but if it's available, they will. And that's kind of what this map is showing. So again, we might possess some skills that help us in the new place. And also, we're likely to kind of choose something that we're familiar with. So here's Wisconsin and settlement in Wisconsin. And this is, this is awesome. So the English, we'll go with them. This is, this is the line between northern coniferous forest, in other words, you know, like 
spruce and blue spruce and evergreen trees, and these are broadleaf trees, trees that lose their leaves. Okay? And the English, where they're from, is mainly sort of like this, forest, and so they settle in here, for the most part. There's some, some exceptions. The Cornish, which is a district in southwestern um, England, and some of you may have heard of the series Paul Dark, right, that's out, and that's from Cornwall. Well, they're miners, and so they settled here where there were some lead mining areas down in here. Okay. American Indians, Amerindians, they're the purple ones. Some are you know, already in, already living in these areas. You see a lot in the forest where maybe they already live, but maybe they're also fleeing to get away from the English and kind of move farther away. I like the Finns. They're in the same place, they're in the north, they're in the forest, and that's kind of where they come from, right? Forested areas, this, a similar type uh, latitude band, although not, not as close, but nonetheless similar situation. But my absolute favorite, and why I love this map, the Icelanders. Right there and only right there. Okay, I don't know the name of the island, but we're talking about Wisconsin, so it's an island right off the coast here of Wisconsin, okay? In one of the, in one of the Great Lakes. All right, so pre-adaptation in Texas. Um, and I'm kind of giving you the spoiler to, here's the answer to the question in the presentation, at least, at least most of it. Um, these are Czech settlements. So here's a map of Czech settlements, and you can see a pretty good correlation. It's not perfect. But they tended, the Czechs and also the Germans, settle where you had these fertile soils underlain by this tall grass prairie. Okay. And that, and they more or less matches that. So that's where they like, that's, they understood that soil, it was familiar to them, they knew it was fertile, and they went to, to those places. The, the upland southerners, they tended to choose sandier soils that were easier to till, okay? but ultimately they were, less, they were less fertile soils, ultimately. All right, and I don't have them mapped on this, but they're going to, in our, in our case study, they're going to the cross timbers area. So they were there first. The cross timber soils are, are sandier, they're easier to till. They don't get as gummy. Um, as the soils of the Blackland Prairie, but nonetheless, there's a difference in fertility there between the two soils. All right, so let's look at the cross timbers. <clears throat> and it's a section, and, and we, I'm assuming we kind of know, most of us know the cross timbers are, we live in and around them. Um, so think of a, an area of, the, of a bands of trees, mostly post oak and, and, but there's elms and there's others, um, but kind of the post oak and the blackjack oak are the, are the sort of the epitome of that. And there's also some grasslands. There's some, and the soil is, is a little bit sandy. And I have up here oak savanna. So in some places there are fields and then you have, you know, stands of trees. A lot of Native American groups preferred to live outside of the cross timbers, but some lived on the edges. And I have up here, as you see, the the Tonkawa and the Caddo also scatter, uh, you know, settled along the edges, but others lived in the prairies. Now, <clears throat> um, the Native Americans, um, you know, we've, we've been told how much they lived in harmony with the environment and so on. And on one level they did, but on another level they didn't, okay? So they didn't, <clears throat> they didn't necessarily live in harmony with the environment, they burned it. Um, and that's what they did. And there's a great article by, <clears throat> excuse me, a geographer named Denovan, and a last name Denovan, and from 1992, and it's called the Pristine Myth. And he talks about all the um, environmental impact that the indigenous people had. It's absolutely fascinating. There's a whole line of work. Some of you may have heard of the book 1491 um, by Charles Mann, also based on a lot of geography uh, and geographers. Uh, just another great book that talks about that. Uh, you know, obviously, 
Native Americans had less of an impact than did Europeans, uh, no doubt, uh, but it wasn't like there was no impact. So they burned the areas and created clearings, um, and of course that set the stage for when the Upland Southerners came in, there were clearings uh, to be there. All right, so everywhere in white on this map is part of the Cross Timbers ecosystem. So it's not just Texas, it goes into Oklahoma and all the way up into Kansas, a little bit into Arkansas. The places in black on the map are old growth forests that still exist, so these are maybe some trees are a few hundred years old. They haven't been cut down. Notice where we are, though, they have, you know, there's no old growth left. It's been, it's been cut down and used for logging. There's a little bit out west of Weatherford, um, maybe some pro it's probable old growth forest. All right, so as we zoom in, just to kind of locate ourselves, Denton, Tarrant County, Dallas County. So this is where you see the cross timbers Eastern Cross Timbers comes in here. This is the Western Cross Timbers out in Parker County, the Weatherford area, Palo, and into Palo Pinto County too. All right, so the typical trees, again, there's elms and there's some other trees, but uh, typified by post oak and blackjack oaks, and here's the, what the leaves look like and the bark, and they're um, sort of irregular growing very hardy, very uh, a hard wood. They grow slow. Um, they don't grow really tall. And they do lose their leaves, so they're not like live oaks that hang on to their leaves year round. All right, this may be, I don't tend to like to read quotes, and I hope you all can read that in the back. Uh, but this was a quote from one of the earliest, if not the earliest, European explorer, Spanish explorer, through the cross timbers of, of, of that we have and that we know of. So in 1716, this is what he, uh, what he, how he described the cross timbers as they're coming across Texas. Uh, he says, it's so impenetrable, you know, we, we had to cut with our axes and our knives and we lost some of our, some of our knives. Uh, it was very difficult. And they finally found an open spot, you know, probably one of these places that had been um, helped to be created by the burning uh, that the indigenous people did from time to time. But as you know, it would be, some places are thicker than this, and it'd be hard to drive a wagon through this because there's uh, trees all through here. And of course, the edges come out like this, right? It's very thick on the edges um, and difficult to cross through. A couple other quotes from individuals who crossed through. Washington Irving, he was traveling in Oklahoma, and uh, I shall not easily forget the mortal toil and the vexations of the flesh and spirit that we underwent occasionally in our wanderings through the cross timber. It was like struggling through forest of cast iron. And so actually this becomes known, the settlers start to call it the cast iron forest. And another Josiah Gregg, a, a merchant and a trader who came through the area several times, they vary in width from third, five, uh, five to 30 miles and entirely cut off the communication betwixt the interior prairies and those of the Great Plains. Okay. All right, so the Upland Southerners come in and they see this, they're coming across the prairie and then a wall of forest that's hard to come through and it's the cast iron forest. Right? And what was interesting for them is you know, again, they, they tended to live in and around the cross timbers. They liked those sandy soils. So they would build homes and settlements on the edges and then maybe hunt um, you know, and raise cattle in the prairie lands, but actually farm in the, in the cross timber soils. Oops, all right. So let's go and see how they came to be. We need to go back in time, uh, some geology here. And these are what are called natural regions. A lot of times people just call them ecoregions today, but in geography we like to think of them as natural regions. So they're combining um, a number of things, the, the rock types, the soil, the vegetation, um, the topography, right? the topography. Um, all right, so I guess we'll start with number one. So we have the Western Cross Timbers, the Grand Prairie, and then Eastern Cross Timbers. This is what comes through, right through Arlington and Fort Worth area, and then the Blackland Prairie in Dallas. All right, so it's about the soil, but to understand the soil, you have to 
understand where the soil comes from. And soils are a product of the parent material, which is the rock that they're, that's being eroded to create the soil, and also the climate of that area, and also uh, the vegetation that's growing on top of it. So the, they all combine uh, to create different soil types. And so what this map is showing, a few things, there's different, there's a, and I'm, I'm not gonna get too much into the details here, but there's a sandstone area. This is the Western Cross Timbers. So when you think sandstone, think cross timbers, right? Um, Poluxy sandstone formation, that's what the Western cross timbers are. Then there's limestones, clays, and marls. A marl is kind of like a, a mud with a lot of calcium in it, um, essentially with you know, shells and limestone mixed in, right? So marls with a lot of calcium in it. That's what's here in the Grand Prairie region. And then we have the Woodbine sandstone, this is the Eastern Cross Timbers, so sandstone, sandstone, cross timbers. Then we go back to shale and chalk, which is another way of saying like calcium and limestone. Okay. And that's part of this prairie zone. And then Taylor Marl, uh, again, this is the kind of a, think of this as a, a, a thick mud or clay, lots of, lots of clay, lots of lime, lots of calcium in this. Okay. And these are formed by uh, deposition during the time, millions of years ago when Texas was underwater. And so think of this as kind of a coastline that may be receding back and forth. They're also been tilted up a little bit. And so you have a sandstones formed right at the coast where larger grains met the water and dropped down to the bottom right away. And then the, the clays and silts and other things went a little bit farther off the coast. Um, so you're also looking at receding coastlines over, you know, millions of years. There's a topography difference, and this is something I noticed that, that struck me in the beginning. Where there's trees, there's hills. You know, really interesting. So what happens is, is that the limestone areas and the marl areas, the clay areas, um, they erode more evenly. So this map here we have Valley View, and so this is up by, this is the Denton area, up, up in Denton, and the Grand Prairie area, and not the town Grand Prairie, but the Grand Prairie Prairie area. And so smooth, the contours are farther apart. So that's showing us it's a gentle slope. There's not as much change in elevation over the space of the surface of the earth. Here's one from, um, here's Monte County and Wise County, and so across Timbers area, and it's very hilly. The contours are close together, very irregular. A lot of change over a short distance on the surface of the earth. So sandstone erodes more unevenly. Limestone is a, is a, it's erodes more, more, uh, more evenly because it erodes easier and, and quicker, particularly in humid regions. Right. So the prairie areas, flatter, Sandstone areas, uh, the cross timber areas are, are hilly. All right, so going to the cross timbers, and here's the soils. Again, there's always exceptions on and, you know, small areas, but generally speaking, here's our soil regions. And so there's a type of soil that underlays the cross timbers, and it is off alpha sols and they have aluminum in them, they have a lot of iron in them. And so they literally turn a rust color, and that's the iron oxide that's in the soil. And so they have this kind of brown, reddish brown, rusty color. They tend to be thin. There's not a big, thick um, you know, layer of soil. The, the top soil tends to be a thin layer of soil. They're also sandier, larger grains and therefore they're easier to till. There's some clay mixed in, but not a lot. So when you get you know, wet soils, it doesn't gum up as much as the prairie soils. In fact, I had a geologist friend who told me he, when he moved here to North Texas, he purposely, purposefully sought out a neighborhood that had, that had post oaks growing in it because he knew it would be this kind of soil and it, he was likely to have less foundation problems. Because the, these, you can't have foundation problems with these soils, but of course, 
the prairie soils, are, you're more likely to have foundation because of the expansion and the contracting of the soil. All right, so alpha saws, western cross timbers. Alpha saws, eastern cross timbers. All right. And of course, more pictures of the cross timbers. Again, blackjack oaks and post oaks, and there's elms and other species, but lots of irregular growth. Um, hardwood, kind of gnarly, and irregular growth, right? Okay, <clears throat> next is the mollusols, and this is fertile um, soil, and it ranges in its fertility, some more fertile than others. It tends to be darker, and you see the picture here. Here's some limestone underlying. It's, it's fairly thick, it's a little bit thicker, the top soil is, uh, than the other region. And you see there's grasses on top. Okay? And so, again, you have that parent material mixing with the, the climate and the vegetation. So more organic content, darker soil, uh, better soil. And it tends to be better as you go to the north for crops and you see more grazing in the south. So what the kind of vegetation that overlies that soil type is, looks like this. So here's somewhere farther to the north, um, and, and this section is called the Grand Prairie. You know, not the town Grand Prairie, but just known as the Grand Prairie. And so it's kind of this gently sloping, remember it's gonna be flatter, so it's gently sloping grassland. There are some hills, but it's more gently sloping. There's some scattered trees and shrubs in there. A lot of cattle grazing, probably to more, toward, towards the west and the south, it's a little bit drier, so more pasture land towards the north. It's a little bit more, slightly more moist, and the soils are a little bit better, so you can have crops growing up there. All right, the next soil and the blackland prairie soils are vertisols, and this comes from the, the term to invert because of the expansion and contracting of these soils. There's so much clay in here. The, the, the grand prairie soils do have clay in them as well, but not as much as the, as the um, as the, um, the black prairie soils do, blackland prairie soils do. And so these even more expand and contract, you know, when they dry out, you see all the cracks. Here's some of this marl underneath, a very kind of thick clay rock. And here, very dark, rich, lots of organic material, tall grasses above, and it goes down, right, much farther, a thicker layer of soil, very fertile, very good for agriculture. And so what you see above that <clears throat> are these tall grass prairies, lots of different types of uh, grasses and native grasses. There's only a few places left where you have these native grasses growing. Uh, but yes, you can graze cattle there and people do, but they're also good for agriculture. And, and so in this region, you see a lot of, a lot of uh, crops being grown as well. All right, so now I wanna focus on this zone right in here, right around this number three right in here. We're gonna look at a couple of case studies uh, right in there. And the three, that's being the cross, the Eastern Cross Timbers. All right, so it's a very busy map <laughs> by, by Terry Jordan. And I want to just point out a couple things, kind of ignore all the dots for just a minute. We'll get to some of those later. But just to orient you, okay, there's the, there's the Red River, so there's the border. This line is the, here's the border of the Eastern Cross Timbers. Okay. Here's Gainesville, Texas, of course. Here's Denton on the edge, right, on the edge. Pilot Point. This dashed line is the other border of the Cross Timbers. So this is the Cross Timbers, prairie on either side, Grand Prairie, Blackland Prairie. All right, so the Upper South Southerners, again, as I've mentioned, tend to settle in these areas in the cross timbers. They, they farm uh, those soils, they're easier to farm, and they kind of settle in this area until the 1870s. They do use the prairie for grazing, they do use the prairie for hunting, um, According to Terry Jordan, a lot of them become lower income, sort of almost like subsistence farmers 
in the 18, you know, 1860s and 70s and, and, and a little bit beyond that. There's a, they're growing peanuts, they're growing cotton. They're not big cash crops. Okay? And of course, there's exceptions to all this. I'm sure we can think of examples that are that's an exception to that, but that's kind of the, the general um, idea. Their small towns become larger towns over time. Okay. At this point, there's not a lot of major towns out in, at least by upland southerners. There's some in the prairies, but not a lot. Okay, then the Europeans, mainly Germans and some Czechs uh, and a few Swedes, come in later on, and the prairies are open for them. Some of them are coming from Europe directly, and others are coming from the Midwest. They've actually already settled in the Midwest, and then they come in to North Texas. And they see these prairie soils open, and these prairie areas open, and they, and they go there. So places like Lindsay, Munster, okay. we've got Elizabethtown, there's Swedes down in here. So here's Swedes, here's Germans, Germans, um, if you look at the key, you see Germans, Czechs, and Swedes. So focus on the different prairies. Germans, Germans, people of German origin out in here. Germans and Czechs over here just outside of Pilot Point on the prairies. Some uh, Czechs over there. And when I first saw this map, I thought, aha, here's an exception, right? And I, as I looked closer, I realized, well, the cross timbers hook around just a little bit. So they still settled in a Blackland Prairie region down there. So you don't see in this particular map, there's no, in this, in this example, you know, there's no Germans or Czechs in this cross timbers. It's really interesting. All right, so they tend to become, you know, there's more reasons than just the ones I'm explaining, but they, they get the better soils and that's the resource for agriculture. And so they become cotton farmers and then they become commercial farmers. After World War II, they, they trend into dairy farming. And they voted both parties, you know, thinking, you know, if you're thinking kind of like political values here, some are voting Democrat, some are voting Republican, but they never voted populist, uh, which is the upland southerners, they tended to vote populist more often. And I love the pool quote here it was almost as if Kansas, you know, the culture, the Kansas, uh, the culture of Kansas or Wisconsin is laid aside, put next to uh, the culture of Appalachia. Okay. So this cultural contrast. Okay, <clears throat> so today in the Great Plains states, um, in parts of the Midwest and in Texas, you can see what we call ethnic islands. And these are these historic small town settlements they still exist today. Obviously, in, in our modern era, they're being you know, absorbed, and it's not as obvious as it used to be. Uh, but for generations, it, they would be, have a small town. Um, they spoke their, whether it was you know, German or Czech or Swedish or whatever it was, their, their, their own language. And they passed the land down through inheritance, so it would stay in the family. And so these little islands, these small towns, would perpetuate themselves. Okay, they could continue on. And so Munster, which is minister in German, they wanted to name it Westphalia, but Westphalia was already taken. There was already Westphalia, Texas. And so they chose the capital Westphalia instead. Munster means minister. And, and so this is kind of west of Gainesville. I showed on the map a second ago. So here's, here's the, you know, it's, it's not... The Upland Southerners tended to be Baptist, not exclusively Baptist, some were Methodists and others, but they tended to be Baptist, and the Germans and Czechs tended to be Catholic and sometimes Methodists. And there's also this urban ethic, so Upland Southerners more rural, and these folks more urban. Okay. They had an older church which was not surprisingly wiped out by a tornado once or twice, and so they have a new church built in the 1950s. This is the older Catholic school that is still used today in Munster, Texas. This is the inside of the new church. And now they're trying to recreate this German cultural landscape. So a lot of these small towns, not just in Texas, but other places, they're trying to promote this, this heritage 
as a, as a form of boosterism and to bring in you know, local tourism, to bring in money, so to speak. So you can go to, I didn't, I didn't go to this, I haven't been there, but last month you could have gone to Munster in April and participated in their Oktoberfest. So I guess there's so many Oktoberfests out there, they wanted to be different and have it in April so someone would come to it. Um, and so, you know, you have scenes like this, they're taking a picture behind a, a scene from Germany, a picture of a scene from Germany. But this is, this is the event and it's becoming more popular. And of course they have buildings and they're trying to recreate this German feel through the architecture, through what we call the cultural landscape. Okay? They're trying to make it a German place and make it feel that way, again, to kind of bring in more, more tourists into the area. Okay, now let's look at the geography of religion as it applies. I've been touching on that, but let's go here. Um, cross timbers, all these dots are different, different churches, and if you're interested, after you can come look at this closer, because I know it's hard to see. And I just want to focus on a few of these things. Mainly, again, emphasis on this, this symbol is for Catholic churches, so here's Lindsay with the Catholic Church. Munster with the Catholic Church, Valley View with the Catholic Church, and Pilot Point with the Catholic Church. And that might be all of them. And this was a map from 1970. So again, this part, of the, this part of Texas, mostly Protestant, but it's part of this you know, German and Czech immigrant introduction. That's, that's where you get the, the Catholicism from, for the most part. And it tends to be urban, again, uh, and sort of an urban rural contrast here. So the Catholic Church is going to be in the city. I did see this exception, which is interesting right here, the church at Pilot Point. And it's, it's the parishioners, you know, the members are out here on the prairie. And so the church is kind of like straddles that, that idea, right? So it's, it's not necessarily in the town. It's on the edge of the town, kind of close to where the, where the members are living. Um, but the others are in, are in cities. So here's the church at Lindsay, St. Peter's Catholic Church in Lindsay. You know, Lindsay's a town of maybe one and a half or 2,000 people today. It's not very big at all. And this church goes back to 1918. And this one was damaged in the past, but they've been able to, to maintain it. And you see the front and the back. And here's the inside. So it's very ornate. Um, you know, Catholicism is this way, right? So saints, lots of symbolism, lots of saints. Um, it's, 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 it's the abode for God. It's a place where God can come. And, and so it's very elaborate. And this church is large and elaborate. It's kind of meant... It's kind of the kind of church you'd see in a town in Germany if the town was, say, 50,000 or 100,000 people, or maybe even bigger. Not, a t not for a town the size of 2,000 people, right? Um, but they were wanting to recreate their Germanness, in a sense, through Catholicism. So let's compare with a, an upland southerner church from the late 1800s. This is, um, in fact, let me go back to the map real quick. Indian Creek, okay, so there's Indian Creek, and this is a church in Indian Creek, oops, built in 1875, and it's, it, it's a meeting place. It's, it's very simple. It's not it's supposed to be elaborate. It's not a place where God comes to visit. It's just a place for people to meet to worship God. So there's kind of two different, uh, you know, culturally two different uses in a sense of how they view the building and what the building should be like. So the quote here, rustic simplicity. And you can see it's in the cross timbers. It's the winter time, but here's our post oaks in the background. It's nestled right here in the cross temple area. Uh, no, uh, you know, there's no steeples on here. Now, it is humble and whatnot, but I have to add that they did import this wood, if I recall, it was pine they imported from Louisiana. So there was some cost and there was some effort uh, to this. All right, lastly, I'll cover um, 
a difference, cultural difference in cemeteries. And cultural geographers, some of us, it sounds, it sounds morbid and it sounds weird, but uh, we, we kind of like cemeteries. Cemeteries are neat in their own way. And, and that's a number of things. Um, it kind of reminds me of an old and kind of bad joke. Maybe, maybe I, well, since I brought it up, I'll say it. But the, the joke is, why do cemeteries have fences around them? It's because people are dying to get in, right? So I know it's a, it's a horrible joke. Um, but it's a joke that's not mine, but it's one that exists out there. So they're part of this, this cultural landscape. And as I mentioned again, the cultural landscape is the built environment it's, it's the part of culture that us as humans, we've created, we've built, and it can be distinctive from culture to culture, as, I, as I've shown you just a few examples already. And you can see this in cemeteries. And because cemeteries are rarely visited, they actually conserve past culture. So they're fascinating places where you can go and see culture that may be perpetuated for, for thousands of years. And, it's hard to find this kind of information in an archive as well. So you're looking at history and culture preserved in a material form over the centuries okay, because people don't mess with cemeteries for the most part. Okay. All right. And again, it does vary geographically in ethnicity. I like Frank Avigliga's quote, cemeteries as the visual and spatial expression of death may tell us a great deal about the living people who created them. And that's the reason to study. All right, so here's the cemetery outside of the Lindsay Catholic Church that I just showed a second ago. And again, they tend to have the cemetery either near or next to the church. A lot of, a lot of times that happens, but the Upland South Southerners didn't always do that as, as a contrasting element here. So this, of course, this is a little bit newer situation, early 1900s versus the late 1800s. But there's you know, very elaborate stones, large stones. Some of these are newer than those, but um, just think of this German, uh, what you see there is an orderliness, a desire to be a part of the community. Nobody's standing out. Uh, the, for the most part, there are maybe a few standing out, but there's kind of a uniformity all in rows and similarities. Um, the, the epitaphs are have a lot of information on them, not just the usual birth and death date. These actually had, some of them have the, their hometown in Germany. So they were really wanting to say, you know, I'm really German, I'm really from Germany. I just happened to be in North Texas when I died. Right? But it's really interesting that this tie to, to home was so important that it was on the tombstone. All right, so let's compare again to a little bit older so you know time matters here but it's a little bit older and and people without as much money but it's still a simple tombstone you see a lot of these in old cemeteries in texas and terry jordan wrote a great book about about cemeteries in texas uh, and this is the cover this is the cover of his book um it says in memory of uh, boy, it's hard for me to read up close. In memory of Mary Cadell, born September the 21st, 1876, died December the 29th, 1901. Farewell, darling. Okay. So they're handmade, hand-hewn, sometimes out of wood, so they don't last. Um, and sometimes out of stone, so they do last a little bit. So contrasting um, in their locations, not necessarily next to the church. There might just be a cemetery off, you know, at a crossroads somewhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be next to a church like we saw um, with the Germans and Czechs. A couple other items. You tend to see a lot of bare earth or scraped earth and mounding. And Jordan believes that the mounding is a British trait to make mounds up over the graves. And he also thinks that this, this scraped earth, which you sometimes see in southern cemeteries, uh, meaning it's done on purpose, where the grave itself is scraped, where there are no grass is growing on it. Um, and that, he believes, is an African trait that's been brought over and introduced into the South and adopted um, widely by, at least in rural areas, by Southerners. Again, in all this, realize there's kind of this small town, urban versus rural contrast. Okay, so 
some of my uh, conclusions to this presentation. You know, remember the idea, nature draws the first line. So the geology, the soils, um, all that influences settlement, where different groups settle. But it doesn't determine, right? So culture plays a role there. The upland southerners actually chose soils that they were pre-adapted to. They, they were familiar with that coming from Appalachia. They chose what they liked and what they were familiar with. The problem was is it helped them maybe in the short term to adapt to Texas, but in the long term, the soils weren't as fertile and the type of agriculture, subsistence agriculture they, they practiced didn't help them long term, you know, financially to succeed. But the Europeans, Germans and Czechs who came later, they sought out soils they were familiar with, um, and so they were more fertile soils. It helped them initially and also long term uh, to prosper. And so we have this environmental variation over the surface of the earth, right? We have different soil types, um, soil regions, if you will, leads to different natural regions or eco regions, and we have different culture groups settling in those different regions. So we have cultural variability because of environmental variability. Again, again, these are choices that are made. So the environment influences, but it doesn't determine, right? It doesn't determine. And that's all. Thank you very much.